All right, we're going to do our two Baroque architecture pieces. So this one's number 88, the St. Charles at the Four Fountains by Baromini. So we've got um, a bunch of images. The College Board wants us to know the outside front facade, the floor plan, and then the interior, what it looks like. All right, so go ahead and label on your front facade picture. You kind of have this waving line that the, the columns are holding up. So it goes convex concave. And on this picture, I know it's really difficult to see. On the next picture, it's a little bit better. And then same thing in your floor plan, go ahead and highlight that undulating wall that is moving around the nave. So this is the nave inside. Looking up, you would have this oval dome. And then we'll talk about what the centerpiece is. All right, so what we need to know is that Baroque architecture here replaces the straight lines of the Renaissance architecture. Our next piece, however, is very straight lines, but this one is kind of undulating. It's supposed to be all about motion and movement. So you have this undulating facade that seems to be in motion. So here you can see the convex concave, right? Kind of waving forms of the stone. All right, let's go ahead and highlight these parts. Um, that's talking about the interior. So it says the appearance of increased height and of actual upward motion is enhanced by the coffers. Remember coffers are those recessed niches in the dome. We saw that first in the Pantheon. Um, is enhanced by the coffers that decrease in size as they approach the center of the dome. So you really can't tell, but that's what's helping create that upward motion. And then the next one, and contains coffers in the shapes of hexagons, octagons, and crosses. At the center of the dome, an oval oculus contains a triangle, which is a geometric symbol of the Trinity and an emblem of the Trinitarian order that commissioned the church. But it's not the kind of dome we expect. It's not a perfect hemisphere. It's an oval. And the church itself is based on an oval, which you don't immediately recognize when you walk in. Boromini received this commission from the Trinitarian Order, an order that was dedicated to ransoming Christians that had been taken in war or by pirates. But the Trinitarians had very little money, and most of this church is made out of very inexpensive materials. It's made out of stucco. Which is a little bit like plaster. It's a soft cement that's easy to carve. As we're standing here, the door opens and closes, and you can hear the traffic of the city of Rome right outside the door. And it's a reminder of just how small a geometric structure. There are two triangles that share one side, and within each of those triangles are circles, and those circles are inscribed. With All right, let's try to draw this out together. So they said there's two, so I'm gonna draw this on my, on my note page, go back here. All right, so we've got two triangles that create a diamond. Got it. Within each of those triangles are circles. Circles. And those circles are inscribed within an oval and that oval. Oval is the primary shape of the floor plan and the dome above. And the two triangles together form a diamond. The opposite points of that diamond define the ends of the lobes on one side, the apse, and on the other. Okay, so I'm going to draw the lobes that is the entrance and the apse on the two ends of my triangles, apse, entrance. Makes sense other side the entrance so we have this feeling of movement of a space that is difficult to understand but the importance of geometry becomes apparent when we look up to this marvelous lobed entablature above that we see that these arches that stretch and deform as they span this complicated shape above that is a dome we see hexagons octagons crosses and at the very center another oval and at the very top, we see a dove within a triangle. 
a symbol of the Holy Spirit, part of a three-part nature of God, which couldn't be clearer set within that triangle. And of course, the order that commissioned this, the Trinitarians, focused their devotion on the Holy Trinity. The light in that lantern reads as supernatural light. When you stand in the center of the church, you don't see those windows, but it looks as though light is pouring down to the earthly below from the spiritual, divine, miraculous source. So the whole church is a metaphor, the complexity in the lower section of the church. All right, so I just wrote that down into my notes. I wrote the dove and the triangle in the center of the dome with light coming through hidden windows. Um, it feels like this supernatural light coming down. So let's do a comparison really quickly. All right, so let's do a comparison of how these different Baroque artists are using light. So they just talked about in this Baromini dome, they called this the lantern, which is the, I guess, an oculus that has architecture that still continues up. It's not an open hole. And then there's windows that you don't really see when you're just down looking up. So it's creating this supernatural, you know, the heavenly light, um, the light of heaven, which is the light of God. And then it's illuminating the triangle and the dome. And then these lines that are kind of radiating out, which we're also seeing in Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. You have the gilded bronze coming down. We have that hidden window right above that's actually creating a spotlight and illuminating and helping this theatrical event that we're seeing almost like it's on a stage. And then with Caravaggio, you have Jesus coming in, right? And then you have this heavenly light coming in with him that's now illuminating this like dingy lit um, tavern. It's like a, you know, a dirty bar. So now it is illuminating this sinful, greedy act that is about, that is taking place because they're counting their money. So now we're going to move on and talk about Il Gesù's, um, not Il Gesù, it's, yeah, it's at a place called Il Gesù. The artist is Gali, and he's painting the ceiling, the fresco here, and then how is he using light? Again, he's using light to reference um, heaven, that holy spiritual light. So he's painting it, Caravaggio's painting it, Bernini is sculpting it, Baromini is sculpting it. Okay, so let's add some notes to number 82. The name of the place is called Il Gesù, and then the name of the painting is called Triumph of the Name of Jesus, and it's the artist's name is Gali, and this is fresco, so paint, we know what fresco is, and stucco. So it's actually sculpted on there as well. You can see these like three-dimensional looking figures, and we'll see a video with some details of it. And this is in the nave of the vault, 1676. And we've got three images. Again, if you look at the facade, that's the front outside, we're back to the straight lines of the Renaissance. All right, so the ceiling fresco fills the vault of the Jesuit church. Whoops, thought that was going to be easier to see. It unifies painting, stucco sculpture, and architecture. Again, we'll see an example of that. And then overall, the painting is really ambiguous. There's a lot of moments you really can't tell what's happening, but if you're um, a believer, if you have faith, then you understand it. All right, we'll look at that in a bit. So we're gonna watch a video that explains the darker paint on the architecture. All right, so go ahead and write on your painting these initials, IHS. This is a monogram for Jesus, kind of like you would see a monogram on towels. IHS is a monogram for Jesus and an insignia for the Jesuits. So it's kind of like a Latin Greek interpretation of Jesus's name. And this is the Jesuits' um, faith. This is what they believe. They just believe in the name of Jesus. So you're going to see this initial repeated or this monogram repeated throughout the church. This depicts, the painting itself is a depiction of the last judgment, which we've seen before again and again, right? You've got figures kind of falling out of the sky. They're falling, plummeting down toward the nave floor, and then they would continue on down to hell. And this is the Jesuit belief that if you don't follow the name of Jesus, you're going to be rejected and damned to hell. Just like we have the um, Luther... Protestant Reformation piece, sorry, that Lucas Cranach the Elder did, where they're saying if you just follow the law, you're still going to be damned to hell. It's not enough. You have to have faith in Jesus. All right, we looked at that one. Um, so again, we're going to compare this to the Renaissance in a bit. Let's watch a little clip of a video.
Blueprint. Here what we have is not just a sky that goes to infinity with clouds and an ultimate glow, a, a spiritual glow, of course, it's not just the sun up there, but it's, it's heaven, but the borders are ambiguous. And during Renaissance art, and certainly medieval art, this ambiguity was just out of the question. Nobody would say, well, should we shade it this way or that? Everything had to be clear. By this point in the history of art, also people knew what they were looking at, I think, in, in a more simple way, and it was fine to make things ambiguous. And we don't know whether we're looking at shading up there or right. painting of right. shade. We don't know for a moment. I've seen many people stop here and wonder whether those cherubs and angels are made of solid material or painted. Oh. And in fact, the fresco yeah. extends on wooden and um, other boards. It's like stage machinery and stage sets out of that central space and actually partly covering oh. the, the vaulting of the ceiling. On top of that, a glaze or in fresco, we would just call it a wash of darker paint extends actually onto the architecture and oh, creates the illusion shadows. that we're seeing the shadows from those clouds. I think about that joining of the spiritual realm and the earthly realm that happens in the Baroque soft. This is the church triumphant. The name of Jesus is the one thing we must follow. But if you are blind to it, if you reject it, if you refuse it, out of being a different religion, of course, this is where it gets very political, or uh, mm -hmm. just uh, ignorance or obtuseness, you are the, the rejected and you're even the damned. And you are those figures who are falling out of that sky into shade, into shadowed areas up there already, and ultimately falling down down to earth and below that into hell. Uh, triumphalism is, is the theme here. And it's not just in the 1600s, but it was established before that because of the Protestant Reformation, which grew through the 1520s and 30s, is now over 100 years old. And we have major wars of religion in Europe. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are killing other hundreds of thousands That's of Christians. Right. This was a very dramatic moment yeah. in, in European history. It's very hard to imagine. All right, so hopefully you wrote down something that said about the context, about religious wars happening at this time. You have Christians killing other Christians because of the different ways that they are being Christian and believing, right? So that's just something to think about. All right, so they mentioned relating back to medieval um, time period and then Renaissance time period. We have the same thing being depicted, right? This is the last judgment, but it's very orderly. There's um, a way to depict it and you have the damned and you have the saved and you understand what's going on and then you get to Il Gesu and it's really difficult to interpret what you're looking at. All right, we also need to mention the influence of Bernini. So our Bernini piece, um, the Exodus of St. Teresa, was 30 years earlier, but this guy... Il Gesso, not Il Gesso, I keep saying Il Gesso, Gali actually worked for Bernini, so he would have learned from him. Um, he uses the same drama, like stagecraft they mentioned, um, and use of multimedia shows the Bernini influence. So you can actually see he has the monogram here, IHS, and then he has these radiating gilded bronze coming out. Same thing, the gilded bronze light coming down onto the Exodus St. Teresa. And then here in Bernini, he's also using stucco. He's using stucco um, including, included with this fresco. Oh yeah, reflects a dramatic moment in European history of Christians killing Christians, the religious wars, gilded bronze. All right, and then for the front, go ahead and mention that the name of the patron is on the front. That's what those words are. And then you've got, boop, right there, the monogram of Jesus, IHS. That'd be it.